we're on Mars. <laughs> so I'm going to go way back. And to facilitate that, I've provided you with my way back machine, a blank slate, <laughs> because I want to take you so far back we don't have a picture of that. About 4.6 billion years ago, when the universe was just a little more than half as old as it is now, the solar system formed. And it was a supreme act of violence. The sun was in the center. Big hunks of rock were made from little hunks of rock, which were made from little tiny grains. How everything came together was a function of the chemistry of the materials. And the chemistry of the materials changed as a function of the relationships between all these little bits of stuff. When the bits of stuff became bigger bits of stuff and we had big rocks and then the big rocks became really big rocks and they glommed into each other, we started getting these protoplanets. And these big hunks of rock that we call planetesimals generated so much heat and pressure by the time you got sufficient mass that you got a lot of melting and recrystallization and before you knew it, well, not before you knew it, it did take until 4.6 billion years ago, we got something that was an amalgamated planet. And that's the infancy of the Earth. That's the infancy of all the planets. And depending upon where they sit with respect to their central star and where they sit with respect to each other, they're all a little bit different. Our closest neighbor is Mars. So the reason we go to Mars is because we want to understand ourselves. Well, what can we learn about ourselves on Mars that we can't learn here? During that 4.6 billion years of violence, sometime we came to a period of enough quiescence so that we could begin to cool on the surface. And as the planet began to off-gas its hot interior a little bit and create water and create atmosphere, we began to mature as a planet. Somewhere between that 4.6 billion years and the 3.8 billion years to which we can go back, we got life. But we don't know exactly when. And we don't know exactly how. Our planet is such a benefit to us in that its surface keeps reshaping itself. The skin basically dives underneath itself. And that's good because that's how we recycle our materials, but it's also bad because the evidence of our deep past, gone. Mars, on the other hand, hasn't got all that activity on the surface. Around 4 billion years ago, 4.1 to 3.9, it was a really bad day, and I use the term loosely in our solar system. Another bunch of rogue planetesimals came crashing through the inner solar system, slamming into the planets. And you see the evidence today by all the craters on the moon, on Mars, on Mercury. We can't quite see through the atmosphere on Venus very well. And we've got that pesky ocean covering on the Earth. So a lot of the evidence on Earth is, is very cryptic. But somehow during that time, we recovered. And we got this robust biosphere. Obviously, we're all here tonight reading the National Geographic, right? But not so on Mars. Mars looks very different than Earth looks right now. But in that window of time between 4.6 billion years and that team of bandit asteroids that came through, it was a 400 million year window. If life formed here then, could it have formed on Mars? And if it did form on Mars, where'd it go? Mars, we know, had water on it. The evidence is ample. Not just water flowing and shaping and weathering the surface of Mars, but water standing in a still pool, the evidence of which we found at Yellowknife Bay the chemistry of which was benign enough that it could have been habitable for life from a chemical point of view. But somewhere between this and this, conditions changed. So the question is, when did they change and what happened? 
So we are standing here at this image at Yellowknife Bay. It looks a lot like a dried lake bed, and we came to the conclusion that that's the best model for what that environment was like. So now I'm going to ask you a question. We've got the minerals. We've got the water. We did some chemical analyses, and we determined we have the canonical six elements that we deem to be requisite for life on Earth. But what else? What are we not seeing that tells us that an environment could be habitable or not? It's like when you go to buy a house. What is that owner covering up that you don't discover until you've signed for the mortgage? Well, one clue is the atmosphere. We're trying to figure out when the atmosphere got so thin. I told you about the rogue asteroids coming through. Unfortunately, during the time of attack, Mars lost its geodynamo. That is, the convection of metallic stuff in the interior of the planet that generates a magnetic field, like our own protective magnetic field, which is really key for protecting an atmosphere and preventing it from being ionized away by the galactic cosmic rays and the solar energetic particles, all of which can do your atmosphere dirt till you're left with this thin little scum of air, which is what Mars presently has. So I ask you to think about this. The chemistry was right. The minerals were right. Is the atmosphere right? We don't know. So that tells us two things. You've got to have all the right stuff together in the right place. But you also have to have everything together at the right time. So the evolution of the environment, not just in space but in time, is key to determining whether or not it's a habitable one. And so Curiosity came to Gale Crater to look at a bunch of history, hoping that one of those layers of rock might be the Dead Sea Scroll equivalent on Mars that would tell us the secrets of the evolution of the Martian surface. Allow us to get a little glimpse into that window of history that might tell us Mars had or had not evolved life. At least we can evaluate Mars from the perspective of the most tolerant and cosmopolitan life on Earth. That would be the prokaryotic microbes. And so we measured these rocks at Gale Crater in Yellowknife Bay, and we determined that the past environment was probably hospitable for that type of Earth life. Check. And then we took a step further, and we dated that rock. Now, the problem is the error bars on an age date are huge. So we don't really know with precision the age. But we do know when the rock was exposed. And we are now proceeding to do likewise on other rocks on Mars, so stay tuned for more of that. But the point is, you've got to know what you've got, where you've got it, and if it's all together at the same time in order to make a judgment like, is the environment habitable? We can't do this alone. It takes the missions that came before us, the Viking, the Pathfinder, Spirit and Opportunity, and the orbital assets that are presently there to pick out the good spot and to guide us as we can pick up and go. Viking was an amazing mission, but it couldn't get up and move to where the action is. We could, and that's why we decided instead of going to Mount Sharp first, where all that history reading awaits, and we'll get there, we decided we needed to take a look first at promising rock even in the midst of the lure of the history awaiting us on Mount Sharp. And so we decided, instead of going to Mount Sharp to the left, that we would go to the right and check out these interesting rocks, these features, these sedimentary structures that portended a right sweet spot in history when we might have had a habitable environment. And so we went to Yellowknife Bay and I'm not going to describe the features of the three different rock types, but let me point out that that's key. You're not just looking at one event in time. You're looking at a change in time. We're going across the horizon, over the edge of the world, and looking at three different eras. When we drilled the hole there, we showed that it was important to have a human make a decision not to just blindly make a plan and go there because of the sake of the plan, but to respond to the science in real time. 
go to where the action is, go to where the science story is, so we're not at the dock waiting for our ship to come in when it flies into National Airport. So we continue to explore. I love this selfie because I can't tell you how amazing it is to get up every day, log on to the latest from Mars, occasionally catch a glimpse of our own selves, and see stuff that I touched and made, and it's on Mars. <laughs> so stay with us. There's more to go. We've finished our prime mission. We've been there for two years. It's a very exciting time, and there are more exciting times ahead.